Okay, hello and welcome to the latest edition of Switch of Play. Uh, myself, Mark Simpson and uh, Mickey Barron. Good evening, Mickey. Good evening, Mark. And tonight I'm delighted we're welcomed uh, by uh, a superb guest in Daryl Clark, uh, former Pools star and legend, but current Walsall manager as well. Good evening, Daryl. Evening, Simo. How's things going? <laughs> all right? Yeah, no, all good, mate. All good. Oh, good. It's been a been a challenging time, like it has for everybody else, mate. But other than that, I'm good, pal. Yeah, this is this is a it's a strange, peculiar situation, isn't it? Like you say, for everyone, and and and, and particularly for people who are managing football clubs, it must be hugely challenging. Yeah, it is. But you know what it's like, Simo. You don't want to be moaning about it, mate. You know, people are dying out there, losing lives, and that's that's more important than football managers and football and sport and whatnot. So. Uh, you sort of, you know, you got to be honest with you. Do get frustrated because you know I love my job and I and I love being out with my players on the training pitch and working away and doing what managers do. But uh, you certainly won't hear me preaching too much. Be uh, certainly with a lot of uh, loved ones being lost. What have you been, what have what, you been doing? What, what what can you do at the moment as a manager? Like what what are you able to do? I know one season's finishing and you're going to go into pre-season a new season. What can you plan for next season? Are you waiting for this season to, to end totally? Or I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what, Mickey, mate. I know what Zoom is now, mate. I'll tell you that open note. Sure. He said a lot of Zoom calls with the, the, the chairman and the, the CEO and uh, still, still doing a little bit of, little bit of organisation. Uh, Zooming my players, speaking to my players. Uh, you're just basically ticking over, speaking to your staff, making sure that mentally, mentally everybody's okay and their families are okay. And uh, I think uh, the, the most frustrating thing, I suppose, as a manager is you're looking for clarity. Well, so many managers up and down the country and, and, and owners are saying exactly the same thing. And uh, it's obviously been very difficult for the powers that be in charge to give you that clarity. One thing I would say, though, I watched the, the, the Zoom. I don't know how many of you have done, but I watched a recent Zoom session you did for the Walsall fans with your, your chairman and um, and some of the, the, the members of your staff there. But the hell, some of you must be bored. <laughs> 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 the, the, the unity that, that seems to be in place at Walsall is something that struck me. You know, like I think the chairman had said, you know, clubs who are, are unified during this crisis are likely to be the ones who come out with strongest. And, and I totally agree with them. No, certainly. I mean, my chairman's a, a fan. He was a director for many a years and now he's become the chairman and uh, he's certainly got all the fans and, and people on board and myself. It's great to work with uh, him, Stefan and, and Dan Mole. Good people. You know, it's a real good togetherness about the football club, which, which Sean, actually, when I went for the interview, to be honest with you, and uh, it's... Uh, it's it's nice to to be be at a football club where everyone's pulling in the in the same direction. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly with regards of of, of of letting fans know and keeping fans informed, we're, we're we're very good for that. And chairman's fantastic at it. In terms what about of, what what about for next season, Daryl? What uh, are plans in place for? For trying to recruit players yet, or is is that not happening because other leagues haven't finished? And you have to see what happens in other leagues with other players. Yeah, I mean to be fair, Mickey, they haven't actually closed us down yet. Listen, it's ninety nine percent sure, but we haven't had an official confirmation. So I've got, a, you know, I need to I need to sort of let players know. But also, we don't know when we're going to restart. So the finances are, are very difficult to to be able to understand what my my final budget may be. So, and, and I haven't been one to make, make those decisions too early, to be honest with you. So, the recruitment goes out the window. I think there'll be a lot of clubs going for younger players, to be honest with you. I think it's going to take a, a good 12 months, 18 months for it to all settle itself down. I think it's a good chance for football to reset, if I'm honest with you. I think it's a good chance for the, potentially, I think that the Premier League get, get a lot of stick but if they can help out the, the clubs a bit more I think they will as well to be honest with you so and I think it's about everybody coming together because you know you know even our time at Artipool isn't it it's, it's community these football clubs aren't they they're about the you know you've got the big guns at, at, at the top level but there's so, so many clubs in the low levels that are big communities I, I'm not saying that the Premier League boys aren't but we lost Berry last year we don't want to be losing football clubs uh, through this and hopefully there's a, there's a lot of help along through the way 
Yeah, the, the, the stuff that Walsall mentioned, I, I noticed you mentioned about, you know, potentially going with a younger squad next year and, and that will be the way that football has to adapt, I guess. Yeah, it is, but uh, that's that's what you have to do as a manager, to be honest. You just keep adapt. I've, n- I've never really had massive budgets anyway. And, and Warsaw is, is a very well-run football club. I think for the last 13 years, it's either broke even or made a profit. Mm-hmm. We spend within our means, so we're going to survive this as a football club because we haven't been spending a ridiculous amount on wages and, uh, and you know what comes into the football club, we're, we're allowed to spend. So uh, we're probably... Well, we are very good. For, I'm very, very fortunate that I'm at a, a managing a very good and well, well organised football club at the minute. Yeah, Daryl, going back to managing when you first started out, obviously, how did how did that come about? How did you feel on that first day when you had to go in the change room and, and sort of introduce yourself to the players as a manager now? And and was that transition easy for you, or did it take a while to find your feet? Yeah, I think it's. Uh, you know what I'm like, Mickey. You spent a change room with me for six years, so I'm quite bubbly anyway. Uh, but uh, I think obviously I was learning on my feet. To be honest with you, I went from coaching Portsmouth under eight to being a first team manager at Salisbury, which is some step up. Uh, but uh, I, I'd done a bit of coaching after school clubs at uh, at uh, schools, and well, it was nothing compared to obviously getting my first my first gig at Salisbury, which was. Uh, which was great. And I'll always be very thankful of uh, William Harrison Allen, who was the chairman at the time, because I put him under a little bit of pressure, to be honest with you, because there was another, there was another a bigger name than me at the time in, in the hat for the job. But he put his neck on the line. And, and I think there was one director, I think it was a three-way vote, three directors is what I can remember. And, and uh, William, William, basically, one said he didn't matter, which, whichever. One wanted the other guy, but William, to be fair, give me that opportunity and chance. But I certainly... I won't be I won't be where I am now to this day if I didn't have that background, Mickey. To be honest, you know, learning at Salisbury in the Southern Prem, working with full time players on, you know, they're only on 100, 150 quid a week. Uh, we had a few senior boys around that, but I could develop there as a manager, and make mistakes along the way, albeit I couldn't afford to make too many because we needed to get promoted. But uh, it was it was good that we was, we stayed full time, having been relegated from the Conference Two divisions. Did you ever do some commercial stuff there as well? And sort of tied in with your football. Oh, I did a bit of everything, Simo. You know me, Dal boy. <laughs> I know, trying to get keep some keep keep the walls from the door. I did a little six week bit of commercial when when, uh, when I was the only contracted player at the football club. I think it was me and Matt Tubbs who who, who was going to get sold. So there weren't many contracted players from that. There was a new board coming. I said, well, listen, I'll have a dabble with a commercial. So I was out selling, I was out selling advertised boards. <laughs> trying to sell it? I was having a bit of banner. To be fair, I quite enjoyed it. You know, <laughs> you, you get, get out there and, you know, you were trying to sell advertising boards. And we only got 700 fans in there. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of people out there in the, in the Salisbury community got behind the football club, which made it a little bit easier. But, uh, it was certainly a different experience, Simmer. <laughs> Actually, Daryl, one of the one of the first questions about from from one of the lads is um, that he heard at the time when you were at Salisbury, you were living in the caravan. Is that right? Oh, that is brilliant. I was, <laughs> my life was in turmoil. <laughs> my life was in turmoil, and uh, yeah, I was staying in the caravan at the. It was based in my assistant's dad's place. We used to train there once a week. And uh, it was a little trailer-like caravan. And I can remember doing shooting practice behind the goal. Strikers, strikers hitting it, hitting my trailer. I went, hey, hey, what were you doing? Like, doing me home there. It was, uh, yeah, it was uh, a little bit of a, a, a change in my uh, life at the time. But it was, we, I find the funny side of things, like I, like I tend to do. <laughs> well, from there, Darryl, you, yeah, you're obviously very really successful there. And then, did you want Bristol Rovers as assistant manager first? Is that right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I worked uh, alongside John Ward. Who I, I didn't really know John, but uh, I, over a phone call, he's uh, he's now my mentor actually with the LMA. To be honest, John, John's a top man. So I went yeah. went 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 across with him. Uh, well, I, I, strange thing, it was a phone call, and uh, I was only phoning him about a pre-season game. But I found out they wanted an assistant manager, so I did a little bit networking as you do, Mickey, in this world. And uh, <laughs> he, uh, we we got together, and he eventually the assistant role which was, which was good and a, a, a real good learning curve for me uh, albeit a change. Fitch and Ford call that Daryl say again sorry Mickey 
decent form call that you wanted a pre-season friendly and got an assistant manager's job i know i know me being cheeky as i am he was literally <laughs> he, he didn't have any games either and i went john i still see you looking for an assistant manager i say listen <laughs> can i kind of send me cv across i hope you're not mean, mind being a bit cheeky i said well because you know i thought so we sort of reached a level level getting to the national league with salisbury you know when he averaged seven hundred a thousand fans and uh, literally, uh, he looked at my CV, which wouldn't have been very good, by the way. <laughs> but he, uh, he gave me an opportunity to meet him. And uh, we got on like an house on fire, to be fair. And uh, yeah, away I went. You stepped up from there, didn't you? And I, I think you, you, you took on the manager's role, didn't you, in the closing stages of the, of the season. And I remember a game you came to Hartlepool, you probably won't want to remember it. But I think Hartlepool beat, beat Bristol 4-0. And I remember yeah. sitting after the okay. game, and yeah, you were gutted about it, and, and you were absolutely devastated with the result. But I sense then there was like a determination in you, a focus about what you needed to do to that football club. Yeah, to, to be fair, Sim, I was assistant then, and I was raging with that performance. We got well tucked up on the day, and uh, to be fair, I'd, not a few weeks before that, we got beat by Chesterfield. I went absolutely ballistic at some of the senior players, which probably wasn't. You know, it wasn't probably for me to do that. It's the, you know, it was a manager's job, but I couldn't help my frustration. And, and at Hartlepool, I think it was 4-1, it finished, or 4-0. Uh, literally, I wanted to do the same, but, you know, John spoke about it. And I just thought that that year, we had a, quite a few players that I thought that let the manager down. John yeah. was, a, was a good guy. He let them down in, in different aspects of it. So, so when I did take over, it was a case of pulling it all together as much as I could. Uh, with uh, with my assistant Marcus Stewart and and trying to bring it all together for those last eight games, but it weren't enough to be honest. And uh, yeah, the, the, it was a it was a tough end to the season for us. One of the things that's always stood in me in my head was uh, I spoke to uh, to Keith at Bristol a little bit about your successful campaign in the National League, and he told me straight away he said what what Darrell did really well was he got the club feeling really humble about going into the National League. It was never about we're too good for this level. I think I think I'm right in saying you sat everyone down at the start of the season and said, "Look, we're Bristol Rovers. We're in the National League, but we're going to treat everyone with respect and we're going to do things right." It was it was key for me that similar to be honest with you because you know what it's like, Mickey B. You know what it's like when you, when you're the underdog and a big team comes in town. Players raise the game for it, and, and Bristol Rovers was obviously a big name in, in in the non-league. So we had to get rid of that straight away. I didn't want any arrogance here, and to be fair, we couldn't afford to be arrogant. To be honest yeah. with you, I signed a few non-league players to go with the lads that that, that I kept on, and it's something I drilled into the players. And everywhere we went, we were we were very very respectful and and did things right. And I was massive on it, and. Uh, he put us in good stead. It was, a, it was a, quite a newish group. I, I made a lot of changes to it, but uh, we quickly started to get that spirit. Spirit. We didn't have a great start, to be honest. We, we didn't start well. And uh, I always tell these stories, picking posters up on my head on it, Clark out off the... Uh, probably <laughs> your people up, to be honest with you. But yeah, I was picking... I was taking them off the crossbar and... Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it was a tough start. But then eventually... I think, Lost one game in 32. We went on a hell of a run. And it was, I mean, you guys will know now, but it's such a tough league to get out of. It's one of the toughest. And we didn't have any parachute payments, but we had obviously a good crowd. So we had a top six budget. Uh, but it was it was really, real tough to, to get out of. And if we wouldn't have got out of it in the first year, we, we, we'd have been like an Oxford or Loop, and I think still down there for five, six years. So uh, it was certainly a tough challenge, but uh, we, we enjoyed it along the way. I was going to say, that's the way to do it, isn't it, the playoff final? And I saw some video footage of you afterwards, uh, really tossing the moment as well. Oh, it's brilliant, yeah. No, yeah, to be fair, I, the, the, the Rovers fans, it, people get the wrong impression of me, Simo, by the way. But I, I love the drink <laughs> of me playing day. I did love a drink of me playing day. But this, it was a semi-final and we, we beat Forest Green uh, in, the, in the second leg at home. And I had to do a little bit on the BT because Grimsby were playing Easter, I think they were, in the other semis. And uh, I was due to have a bite to eat with a wife, uh, one of my coaches and his wife. But we went past this pub down Gloucester Road. I don't know if you've ever been in Bristol. And it was absolutely chocking. So we stopped the taxi out there and I thought, yeah, come on, let's go and have a look at this. And I just walked into the pub. I just walked. I've never, been, I've never done this before. And I just went, Wembley, Wembley. <laughs> Started singing. It was brilliant. The place erupted. I was doing speeches and all sorts after two free pints. Mickey will tell you that. But I've had a couple of pints. That's it. Yeah. Leader of the party, and uh, no, it, was, 
it was it was all a bit of premature, and I was singing. We were going up, which I, I tell you, the next day I was thinking, oh wow, because uh, one of the, the I think it was a Greenwich, Greenwich Telegraph got hold of it, and yeah, it was uh, it was it, to, to be fair though. I must say this, and it's always served me well as a footballer, and, and Mickey was the same. I've always mixed in with fans. I've always had time for fans and, and being around it. You know, they're the heartbeat of football clubs. I don't want to sound corny here, but there's some good people out there. It's a working man's game is football. And, and, you know, fans appreciate that sort of side of things. They appreciate players speaking to them, chatting them, and, and not thinking that they're, they're, they're bigger than what they are. And I certainly enjoyed that one. <laughs> I don't think I had to buy a drink as well, which is always a Brucey bonus. <laughs> so, Daryl, when uh, going back to that season and you go down to the National League, did you have to change tactics or did you change formation going into that league or did you stick with what I you wanted? Do, do you know, Mickey, I was fortunate, wasn't I? Because I played a couple of seasons with Salisbury in the National and obviously managing Salisbury, I knew what non league football was about. And trust me, for me in that division, You've got to have, you know, that point, five, six big ones. The good thing for me in the national, that is I could, I could it's not like the EFL, obviously. I could, it wasn't a transfer window. So I could do one or two tweaks along the way. But I reckon from August to October, pitches are relatively decent, not, not EFL standard. Then after that, the pitches deteriorate. The refereeing is debatable. <laughs> and everything becomes a leveller, and, and you've got to be you've got to be able to find games to win games at uh, a very very tough places to go, and it's so hard for ex league clubs to go them and get their heads round it, and that's why we did, and that's why we got up for me. I'd had that experience in the in the non league non league background, and I knew exactly what it was going to be like, and uh, yeah, it was uh, some tough places to go, but some really enjoyable ones as well. You know, there's it 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 there's a lot of good people in the non league scene. So after after obviously success again, Daryl, um, and promotion again, there was times when you were linked with uh, Leeds United. Can we speak about that? And was that yeah, going yeah. off the wall or yeah, it was uh, it was a point where things were going really really well at Rovers. I met Massimo Cellino, and uh, a lot was said about the the, the 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 clubs agreed the fee. You know, it was Leeds and a lot of people say it to me now that, you know, I should have, should have gone. But uh, I was really happy at Bristol Rovers. And uh, there was there's, there's, there's a few things that, that would probably happen at Leeds that I'd have probably lasted two months, Mickey, to be honest with you. I really would, you know. He, 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 I think he'd gone through something like 49 managers in, in what it ever had been. And uh, I just thought I'd show a bit of a loyalty to the football club that's shown loyalty to me they could have got rid of me when we got relegated they give me an opportunity and the fans give me an unbelievable opportunity to be honest with you the majority of them stuck with me all, all, all the way and uh, I think uh, I think you've got to sometimes you'll know me better than others Mickey that you've got to show a bit of loyalty in this game haven't you I think it comes to reward you uh, down the line yeah, I think sometimes as well it's just that feeling Daryl isn't it it's you know, had times in your career where you might have had a chance to sign, and it just doesn't feel right. So I think sometimes like you say the loyalty side of it, but you get a feeling that I don't really want to go there if I'm going to last six weeks. Yeah, and and the thing is for me, Mickey, I wouldn't have been doing the recruitment. <laughs> yeah, which is you live and die by your decisions as a manager for me. Yeah. Recruitment, don't you? You know, and all of a sudden you you're going to be working with a lot of players with somebody else having a big say on recruitment. And uh, that didn't that didn't tick the boxes for me, and uh, certainly will I ever get that opportunity to again to to manage a massive club like that? Who knows? You never you never know in this game. But I still think it was the right decision, and uh, and I don't think I'd have lasted too long. Can I just There's say, ghost in the ground, there, Mickey? Is there a ghost in the ground? <laughs> Is that your chocolate biscuit? I'm magically opening the cupboard. <laughs> Look at them chocolate biscuits, Simo. Eh? <laughs> Mrs. B's crawled round on hands and knees so she doesn't get seen and the cupboard just opens magically. <laughs> <on the cupboard. laughs> it's Jeffrey's. It's almost half a little in there. <laughs> <laughs> when you went hey. <laughs> Brilliant. We've got when another impost we got another imposter in a minute. My cat's just got on me as well. <laughs> <laughs> 
you, you really brilliant. carried momentum, didn't you, when you when you came up from the National League? Obviously, with Bristol Rovers, that momentum just and it's happened with a few clubs, hasn't it? Who've come out of the National League and carried on in League Two and had had further success. Yeah, no, it, it has happened. Momentum at football clubs, but I, but I must say, uh, my time at my time at Hartlepool. The changing room we had at Hartlepool, and we'll discuss that a little bit more later, was has put me in good stead as a football manager. Does that make sense? Listen, I've always been live and I've always been bubbly. Uh, you know, I, I've always thought that in a change rooms, I'm good to have without being arrogant. Do you know what I mean? Mickey will probably disagree because the band is <laughs> shocking. But the, the togetherness that we had as a group of lads, but with the work ethic, it wasn't a case of, you know, we're good lads on and off the pitch. We also had an unbelievable work ethic and desire to, to you know, to want to win at training. You know, there are arguments and all sorts in training, but then we're going out and have a pint or have a bit of banter in the change rooms after. And that, that put me in good stead as a manager. It put me in as I knew what a change room should look like. And for me, it's all about your environment and your changing rooms and your togetherness. And you know, Simo, you, you was... Uh, you was very much hands-on, weren't you, in the media department. And uh, you've seen what was happening with a special group of players there. And I've been fortunate. I've been able to, to grow them sort of change rooms at clubs. Hey, I'm a lucky cat, by the way, Gizzy. Don't get beat in playoff finals, DC. He really does look with his cat. Hey, <laughs> never lost a promotion final with his cat. <laughs> In terms of at the end of at Bristol Rovers, I, I've seen a few quotes about you know the, the 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 things were going on behind the scenes. There was politics, which can happen in football, can't it? It's it's, it's one of the the ailments. Yeah, it can. Uh, it can. I mean, it was it was a it were it, it turned out to be strange, but I got on really well with all the people. You know, while well, the president, the chairman, Steve Amos, CEO Martin Starr, I got on great with them all. But there wasn't a togetherness about the place. You know, any. And he was the wild brother who, who saw it was the, the guy with the, the figures and whatnot. And it was never real. There was never real togetherness that side in, in in the boardroom, and that that made things didn't make things difficult. But I just didn't know where we was going to go, where we was going with it. And if anything, I probably I probably stayed a little bit too long because when I knew the training ground and the stadium, and, and you know, I'd sat down seeing different training ground plans and, and uh, stadiums and all of this. I just want people to be honest straight down the line. And that's, and that's all the Rovers fans want, by the way. You know, most fans, in fact, most fans at most football clubs just want honesty. You know, if you played rubbish, tell them you played rubbish. If you, you know, what's happening with the football, just tell them. You know, a lot of people hide behind things when the best way is the honesty because a lot of loyal football fans stick by their club anyway. But they don't They don't if there's that split. And that's when uh, things go wrong at football clubs. Yeah, I have to say, Darrell, I've, I've, I often get sent clips on our WhatsApp group of your interviews after matches. And the one thing you're always honest, I mean, sometimes I'm thinking why you're saying that, but it's a, it's a raw emotion after a game and, and you are being honest about how your team played, about how certain players have played. And like you said, I think fans do appreciate that. They understand how frustrated you get with the players, how frustrated you get with certain performances. And that certainly comes out in some of the interviews you see after games. Yeah, I, I get a bit of criticism for it, but then, then I get a bit of praise for it. Because, but, but what I always say is, Mickey, it's nothing I said to my players. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, it's not. It's, it's, I've not gone in and you know give them a cuddle because they've lost and then come out there and armour them. Yeah. I tell them straight. And uh, you know yourself as a player, Mickey, the managers you 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 played under and whatnot. You just want honesty, don't you? Why you've been left out of the team or or what you think after a game. Uh, you know, I, I played under managers that that would say something in the change rooms, go out to the press and say something else. So they, they basically just get a, a rehearsal of, of, of what I said. And don't get me wrong, sometimes I, I play the game as you've got to. But I always I always try to be as honest as I possibly can with the performance. Yeah, I remember. You know, because fans see through it, don't you know? Yeah, I remember um, not long after Coops came to Hartlepool, we were playing and we hadn't played very well. And we are walking down the tunnel. And I thought, well, I'd, I'd, I'd played all right, 45 minutes. I'd, not concede the goal, I've done all right. And Coops walked past, he comes to the change room, he said, I'm going to hammer you in there. And I was like, eh, why? He said, because <laughs> if I hammer you, everyone else will take notice. Yeah. And, and he, he, he did it quite often, he would just say, Mickey, 
don't say anything. I'm going to come in. I'm going to have a go at you. And it's just to to sort of live and everyone else up. Do you know what I mean? So I think yeah. sometimes those, those things are important for a manager to be able to do, aren't they? That's that's testament to you, Mickey. I mean, what I say now, mate, is that the few and far between players are you were, you know, particularly. There's a lot of players now that aren't made that way. And that yeah, you have to adapt to the different, you know, we did the old YTS scheme, Mickey, didn't we? Cleaning boots, yeah. changing rooms and all the stuff like that. At them days have all gone. You know, these academy players now, they they're all world beaters. I spend I spend a lot of my time giving them slaps, to be honest with you. Not slaps, but Verbal, verbal, absolute, straight down the line. You are ten a penny, lads. Do you know what I mean? Get your, you know, re- sense of realism straight the way through. And I've had a bit of success of managing that way. But certainly, me being able to do that with a player, maybe one or two of the seniors still, Mickey. But it's it's hard to go on and set that up now. And uh, to be fair, I've always gone in there with me, me pure emotion. But you, you know yourself as well. If you're on a losing run, the worst thing you can be doing is having a go at players every week, Mickey, don't you? It's a death, it's through a deaf ear, isn't it? It's still a massive confidence. It's a massive thing in football. So you've got to, you've got to be cute with it. But Coops are great at that, I thought. He's one I, have of to, I, have to, I have to say, though, Darrell, when I was caretaker, manager of Hartlepool, we hadn't won at home for ages. And I was, I was racking my brains to try and think of something just to... To take the pressure off the players at the start of the game because everyone was like, we can't concede the first goal. So I was driving down the game and I thought, you know what, I'll give it a sub story. So I've gone in, I've sat everyone down and I said, look lads, I've had some news today. Family member, not very well. One of my kids, not very well. And you know what, it puts everything in perspective. It's a game of football we're playing. Yeah. Enjoy yourselves, takes everything, takes everything off. And about two seconds later, someone knocked on the door. Mickey, is everything all right? Well, and then one by one, all the players come in. I was like, oh, God, this is backfired. <laughs> I was like, I'm not doing that again. That's going back yeah. to Charles, honestly, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it does. But, yeah, but, but what I say is I see that, and, and I've used that, Mickey. I'm not just saying it, and it's worked. Do you get yeah. what I mean? It, it, it's time to take the load off the players. Do you get what I mean? In, in yeah. different ways. There is that. Uh, I've always been a great believer. Come match day, if you're a manager worth your weight and you've got a decent coaching staff, you've done your work in the week, the pressure's then on the players to perform on a Saturday. You've got to come off it. Uh, we all know you've got to win. Players know they've got to win on a Saturday, don't they? Well, let's hope so. Do you get what I mean? So the more you, the more you sort of come off that and, and trust in the game plan that you've worked towards. And there's so many different ways. I can remember the playoff final, Mickey, using a similar story about... Uh, you know, obviously, I lost my mum at a, I was a young age. And, and I did the same sort of story. Say, listen, this ain't life or death, lads. Do you get what I'm saying? There's people dying. Go out there and enjoy this experience to the final at Wembley. And I'm sure loads of managers have, have done exactly the same thing. So, and, and it's, the right or wrong of it, Mickey, is very, very, it's very tough. And like you said there, you're on a, when you're on a bad run as a, as a manager, you, you're not sleeping, are you? You're searching for all them answers, and they're they're hard to find. And the right or wrong answers of them are very, very variable. Because you you could say everything the right, Mickey, and you can get be one nil down from a uh, you know referee's decision, can you? Yeah, definitely. Uh, def- I think that's the frustrating side of it, isn't it? That your preparation can be absolutely perfect, and as you say, two you can be two deal down in ten minutes, and it's got nothing to do with the players, the formation. It could be a wonder goal, as you said, deflection that goes in, and and there's nothing you do about that. No, it's mentality. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, if I was going to go on 100 percent of what I look at it, 60 percent, 70 percent is mentality of your players. Listen, as managers, as for so you can set your team up. How you think you're going to win? You can, you can do that. You set your teams up. But you need 60%, 70% is, is, is a player's mentality. Going a goal down, being on a bad run or winning even the other end where you're winning lots of games. You know, the mentality of coming off it. You know, and uh, you need your luck. You need your 10%, 15% luck as well, to be fair to you. But uh, mentality of players, come on. They don't, they don't make them as, as they used to in our changing rooms, Mickey. That's for sure. <laughs> so... Going full circle back to what we started with, Daryl, we'll come back to signing from Hartlepool. And again, one of the lads is sending the question that, you, obviously, you came from Mansfield for quite a big fee. And when we heard it, I think, it was, was it £75,000 at the time? I think time? so, Mickey. I think it was the record at the time. You lot were laughing yeah, well, it off, weren't you? 
we thought it, the club had actually bought Mansfield because is Mansfield the worst place to live in England? Hey, I won't be having a bad word about my hometown, Mickey B. You know your town. It was <laughs> I, I signed the same day, didn't I? Richie, John Bass, Tommy Widrington, myself. Was it? Was it the four? Was it another one? No, it was those. Okay. Those three and you. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I was the best out of them for, for <laughs> about them three, by the way, as well. By the way, sure, there's a few Robin that live in there. Yeah, I mean, I Richie got a street named after him. I'll never know, by the way. Where's my street, by the way? Uh, I kept that club going with my banter. I didn't even get a look in. You got one as well, didn't you, Mickey? What's your I street, Joe? How's prices have gone down on my street, though? Yeah, it should be Stan, Stan Finder. Stan Finder Street. That's what it should be. <laughs> So why why Hartlepool, Darrell? Why did you sign for Hartlepool? Was he? He must have been weighed in. But apart from that, what was it? <laughs> weighed in. You're having a laugh. But uh, no, it, it just felt right. I think you told Tommy Miller, Mickey, didn't you? you to, Tommy Miller went to Ipswich, didn't it? And I, I rumoured to be Ipswich. I never asked George Burley this, but I, I was rumoured to yeah, either to be me or Tommy Miller that was, was Ipswich were interested in. But then Tommy went to Ipswich, got. Got his mansion, yeah. I went to Hartlepool and got my flat. So, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, Chris, Chris Turner, you know, Chris, Chris is a great man, great guy. He, he sort of sold the club to me. Went to meet, uh, funny story, Mickey, actually. I went up, I can't remember my agent at the time. I went up, uh, first time I saw he picked me up in a Porsche, right? I've never been in a Porsche, by the way, from Mansfield. So, he picked me up in Porsche, right? We've got up to Hartlepool. He's, he's gone, uh, I've gone in, gone in to meet Chris, uh, me and the agent. I can't remember, even remember his name. And uh, anyway, and, and the agent's gone down. I'd like you to read the room now. I want to have a quiet word with, uh, quiet word with uh, Chris and, you know, like talk about my deal, Mickey. So I've, I've gone in the car and waited there half an hour. Then all of a sudden, agents come out with Chris and whatnot. Agents come over and uh, Chris, uh, agent says to me, Chris wants another word with you, Daryl. So just a word with me on myself. Chris pulled me to one side. He went, bloody hell, Daryl. I says, I want you. He says, but you want more money than what Peter Beers you're on at Newcastle or something. The agent had gone in <laughs> bloody all sorts. Absolute all sorts. I was like, that was desperate for the, the move. I'd been at Mansfield a long time. And I was like, listen, Chris, we'll get there. So we, he probably pulled me pants down, Chris. He never told me, but he, he's probably pulled me pants down on the deal there. <laughs> what, what do you remember about the early days there? Because I, I I just started work sort of um, the start of two thousand and two, which was the the, the, the the back end of the season when you signed. And one of the first things you did was score that hat trick against Swansea. Cure, yeah, good game, Simo. That yeah. Now we we were we were bottom of the table, Mickey. You won't be early doors. Yeah, we yeah. had new signings. I can always remember it because we uh, we were, I think, I don't know if we played on the Friday, got beat, played really well, got beat, and then Saturday we thought, oh, we'll all go out, we'll have a all yeah, day. Well, well, we played, I'm sure, and this is one of my only memories, we played, I'm sure we played Rushton away on the Friday night, because I think I scored an own goal, yeah. and we got beat, but we played all right. And then I remember we're out in Newcastle the next year, and it was yeah. a day Beckham scored. The free kick, wasn't it? Free kick. So yeah. we've gone bottom of the league, and then Beckham scores, we're all in a pub celebrating. Right. I'll never forget Rich Humphreys turned around to me and he said that was, a, that was a moment where he thought, I've signed with the right club, but we're going to be all right type of thing. It was that sort oh. of thing. Hey, it was good of Richie to say that because his fault we struggled. He couldn't hit a barn door up top, could he? <laughs> Jesus. Eh? Listen, we were battering teams and we couldn't hit a barn door. No, seriously. <laughs> And it was it was literally we were playing really well, so the belief was there, Mickey. I thought, do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Chris was great. Chris was great on the on the not so good run. New players coming into the football club, and the fans were, to be honest, if I can remember, right? The fans were good because we were playing some good stuff. And then literally after that, we never looked back from there, did we? Cracking night out as well. I can remember nearly falling off the stool. I think we were supposed to be as well. That's <laughs> cracking night, yeah. we yeah, one of many then, Mickey, wasn't it? At the time, uh, I've, got a, I've got a few questions about some nights out, Daryl, later on, so we'll oh. keep them for a little bit. We'll keep them for a little bit later. So, uh, can I put on record? I've changed loads when I was 28. That was it, you know. I'm a family man now. Can I just put that on record? 20, <laughs> yeah. So, what, what was what was Chris good at Darrell, what, what when he was managing, what would you say his strengths were? Because as you say, he went on a run there where we just went from strength to strength to strength and the momentum like you spoke about before was, was just getting better and better as that run went on. 
Yeah, simplicity. I think uh, I think the recruitment of the change rooms was spot on. You know, and uh, the the way what I'd say with that and and how we built the success through that was that 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 hardcore of players. Mickey, you was already there, weren't you? Yeah. You know what I mean? And it was it was the end of a, if I can remember right, it was the end of one or two old boys or coming towards the end of one or two old boys and and uh, J J B and 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 Richie and Tommy and myself were were all characters in our own right, mixing in with some good lads in there and some good younger players that was was coming through. And I think that the recruitment was was great. A great mixture of good senior players that were still hungry, very, very hungry. And a great mixture of new players that wanted to do well, that had something to prove. You know, Richard come and... Had, had Richard been released from Sheffield Wednesday, Mickey B? Or, or, do you know yeah, what I mean? He, he was, or Cambridge, had he? He, 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 had, he, had to, he had something to prove, didn't he? And, yeah, he uh, did uh, and so did I. I think he had a, a stress fracture. Um, no, he'd, he'd, he'd been, and I think he was just, he was drifting, wasn't he? Obviously, he, he wanted to find a club and cement some, some games and, and play some games. So I just think from my point of view, it was great because all of a sudden we had people in the dressing room that weren't from the northeast that were bringing yeah. some different, like, everyone that knows Bassey. I don't know another footballer like Bassey. Do you yeah, know what I mean? right. Like... What's different to the changing room and, and it was brilliant. Tommy Widritton had played in at a big club and he had that mentality about him and he just he wanted he wanted to win, he wanted to have the ball. So that sort of that getting different people in that weren't directly from the northeast, but in my opinion, was brilliant and great bit of recruitment. Yeah, it was great balance, wasn't it? A great balance of the different characters. I don't know how much work you'd have to ask Chris yourself. I don't know how much work he actually did on, on getting to know the actual characters that he was building in, but it was a real good balance of experience, mixtures, young lads. It just grew, grew as a grew as a squad of the players and, and 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 friends now that you know, it's like Mickey B. I spoke to him today. I might speak to Mickey a couple of times a year, three, four times a year, might pop in. And it's like we've never been away. And, and there's yeah. seven or eight of them boys are exactly like that. They, they know they've only got to pick up the phone if they need anything, if I can help. It. And likewise, I know they're there for me now. And you don't get that at many football clubs. And we had that at Hartlepool. And, and that was the start of it. Yeah, Darrell, one of the, one of the stories is actually about Chris. And, um, and, and I remember it vividly. I can still see it now. We were doing we were doing 11-11 practice match at Hoffle. <laughs> it, was a, it was a small pitch. and. Um, I just remember, I'll, I'll set the story up and you can finish it off, Daryl. So we're playing this game and, and Daryl goes down injured. So Daryl, go on, you'll carry on from there because you'll, you'll hey, tell it. Look. I didn't go down injured. My back went, right? It was literally, I literally, I, I think I'd done a step over, which I weren't great at. And literally, my back's gone. I can't move. And I'm lying on the, on the, on the pitch. I'm in absolute agony. And I really, nobody could move me, right? And, I, and, I, and I'm effing and blinding. I've got the yellow T-shirt on. No word to lie. You know the worst trainer of the week, which the lads like giving me. because uh, yeah. Can I say it? They're arseholes. But anyway, <laughs> well, they, had the, they had the T-shirt on that always got me in a bit of trouble because I had a big cop. But I'm lying there and I can't move. They've had to call an ambulance. You know what they did, Timo? They coned me off. So I was on the touchline. Oh. They coned round me. Listen, coned round me, continued playing. <laughs> continued playing. Ambulance has come. <laughs> they brought this yellow board. I'm in a neck what with neck brace on I'm on this yellow board and the lads are just laughing me. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely cacking myself, me. I think I've I don't know what I've done, to be honest. I think I'm paralyzed. I, you know, I'm, I'm literally getting on this board with this t shirt that let me tell you the t shirt had a lot of swear words on and all sorts oh, no. of things as well. And straight to A and E. And <laughs> funny story is they scanned it, scanned it, but like half an hour later it started losing up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and needless to say, when I got to training again, I got a bit of stick for that one. But oh, God. Ew, listen, talk about health and safety now. Cure, Chris, I should be suing him. If you listen to this, Chris, I'm suing you. <laughs> oh, brilliant. That's uh, spirit, though, you mentioned there about the lads had. That, I think there's, it's never been shown more than the, the following season in 2002 I don't think you've. Uh, opened your account for the season and got to Christmas time and there was a game against, I think, Cambridge. We were 2-0 up and we got a penalty and, and the lads all... Timo, how could I open my account when Mickey B never passed it to me, mate? <laughs> That's let's true, get yeah. Hey, let's get there for we. Yeah, so basically Mickey didn't pass me the ball so I couldn't get a goal. 
I missed a few. I give it that. I missed a few. Yeah, and the, the spirit was good. To be fair, they let me take a penalty, which I only just squeezed in. By the way, <laughs> I can remember I squeezed it in, and uh, no, that. But that was that was the sort of lads they, they, they were. They, they, they knew it was playing heavy on my mind, but they knew I was. Hopefully, they knew I was playing quite well and um, doing my bit for the team. And uh, you know, they give it me straight away. So no, it was it was brilliant. It, it was it was great, mate. It was great. It was lucky to see that in the back of the next. I think I ended up getting six or seven. I normally got six or seven each season. Well, the one the one that stands out from that season for me is the one at Boston when we really ground out the uh, the, the one nil oh, yeah. on the snow. Uh, tickle, tickle the ball over the top. Great, the great yeah. tickle, tickle head. Uh, yeah, he, uh, he was one of the best long range passes of the ball ever. Tinks. He found me a couple of times in that game. He's he t- over the top. Evans were manager, wasn't he? He was giving yeah. me pelts in the dugout. Bless him. I get him well with Steve now, to be fair. <laughs> Took a tough following bottom corner. By the way, I never had a kick all game, by the way, because I wasn't that sort of player. Mickey will tell you that. The, hey, the funny thing is, right, I used to play Mickey B side and he used to eat it. Because <laughs> me, I like to wander around the other side of the <laughs> pitch. The week. amount of bollockings he used to give me was like, <laughs> listen, it was absolutely simple. <laughs> I'd, I'd shoot over to the left wing. I could just hear him. Could you it? Like, goodbye. <laughs> he come back. He give me another air for five minutes later. Mikel's off again, wasn't I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, was, I, I, I used to just, he used to come back over there. I used to give us a look or a smile, and then I'd be like, I can't keep shouting at him. He's, <laughs> I, I was just, I was, I was fortunate. I had a good fullback behind me, Mickey. To be fair, mate, <laughs> I, I, I like to wander off because I was a centre midfielder anyway. But he yeah, played me out wide, Chris, a lot of the time. But, but normally you'd turn up with a goal or something like that, so you couldn't keep. Talking about the spirit, Darrell, I've got a couple of, of mentions about nights out, and not two. I'll, I'll talk us through the first one. You can do the second one. I remember, we, I think it was a Christmas party where we decided for, we used to have a different theme every year. This year was Cowboys and Indians. So we'd all got the new in. So we all got like half us were Cowboys, half us were Indians. What were you, Darrell? I can't remember what you were. Do you remember? I don't know, but I was left behind. <laughs> yeah. So we're in the bar for a couple of hours. Humps has organised the taxis like normal. So everyone's got on the taxis, and obviously everyone's dressed up, so you can't really see who's who, and there's bows and arrows, and there's stuff flying everywhere. So we've gone in the taxi in Newcastle, and everyone's like joking around, not really realising. And the, the guy that used to own the pub, we used to be quite friendly with, so he was telling us a story later. The Daryl's come out the toilet with his bow and arrow trying to shoot everyone. The pub's totally empty. Honestly, no it, was, it, was, it, was, it was the most surreal moment I've ever had. I've been on the <laughs> toilet for a, for a bit and, and I've come out, <laughs> come out ready to fire a few arrows and literally no one's there. <laughs> I'm thinking, where is this everyone? Because he's a, he a pub on it not far from the training ground, Mickey, yeah, wasn't it? Like, a road, yeah. And literally, I thought, oh, they're riding outside. Well, all 30 of them. So I'm I'm running around this pub going, nah, nah. I'm going back in. And where they go? And then eventually I've asked the guy behind the bar, he went, Oh, I think they got in the minibuses. We used to have some great Christmas do's over Mickey, didn't we? It was it, it, the, the spirit there. And and listen, it's something I still encourage as a manager at the right time. Trust me, points were won on the days that we used to have and the trips that we used to have. Promotions were won and togetherness was won. Because when you're out at the right time, having a drink with your teammates and getting to know each other and knowing each other who did, the families, you know, the, the, the wives, the girlfriends mixed together, that's what got a success at Hartlepool. And we had some cracking days, cracking trips abroad. I mean, Magaluf every year without fail for the weekend. We used to get standing innovations in Magaluf. We used to take over the Daiquiri Palace. We used to run that show. The guy, I think he's an American guy, wasn't he, Mickey? He used to bring yeah, us free yeah. food and all sorts. We used to drink in there all day. Hey, let me tell you about the story. Can I say this? Sadly, Coop's blessing. Loved him to bits. Rest in peace. We're a Dakri Can you remember that with a chair, Mickey, mate? Yeah. Oh, it, was it was comedy gold. We had this chair down Dakri Palace, right? So basically, you had to be down Dakri Palace. If anybody knows my glove, it's right on the beachfront. You had to be down there at 10 o'clock every morning. If not, you've got a triple forfeit drink drink to have you know if you're late we, we were quite strict on it so anyway well anyway we, we, we've got a few of us down there Mickey had been down there and, and, and Richie and whatnot and anyway there was this chair where it were broke and every time somebody sat on it it fell through it and it was brilliant it was comedy gold so what we were doing for the whole course of this day but well, you could put it back together 
this big green tray. So basically what we'd do, we'd set it all up and uh, lad had come down and we'd get him one of them ice cocktails. They do like them ice cocktail things. Well, ah, come on, don't worry, don't worry about it. We're not going to give you a treble. Try one of these. And we'd get him to have the cocktail and say, ah, take a seat. And he'd sit on it and he'd chuck his drink all over his face and all down his top. It was brilliant. And we're obviously crying out laughing. It's one of those where you probably had to be there. Hey, a couple hours later, Neil Cooper, best him's coming up. Gaffer! Gaffer! Get yourself in here. Get yourself. <laughs> he set the chair up. We set it up. He, he loved it anyway. Too bless him. He, we, we set it up. Coop, gaffer, get yourself in here. Have a drink with the lads. He, he was there with uh, some of the staff, not obviously with us. And he sat in that chair. I think you set it up with two cocktails, Mickey, didn't you? You give him, yeah, you give him, you give him one in each hand, and literally sat in his chair and literally all over his face. And that and the lads are just going, each chick gaffer was brilliant. It was comedy gold at the time. <laughs> It was brilliant though know, because everyone that came down we were like, hey, well, this is how much we think about you. We've kept you this chair right in the middle spot and you have a bit of crap with everyone. And everyone, <laughs> I remember Joel going through it and everyone that came down, they're just, oh, cheers, lads, I'm struggling here. Just let us sit in there and poof, straight down, as Daryl said, things flying everywhere. Uh, what about what about this story, Joel? Uh, Joel was a great Aussie lad. You know, you know Joel. He was a great lad. Boy, the boy could knock the drink. The Aussies can drink. Right, literally, but, you know, we'd normally take it a bit steady on the last night. We'd only be there three days, end of the season, right time to let your hair down. But <laughs> Joel's decided, he used to drink this vodka Red Bull, pints of it, and pints of it, pints of it. And, he, and on the last night, he's going for it. He's going for it. Flight must have been in the morning. He's been out drinking all night, all morning. Some of us have managed to get a couple of hours sleep. We had Eddie, and literally on the plane, the lads, this is how bad it was. He's, he's as rough as a dog, right? Nobody could, you know, you couldn't sit near him because he, you know, whoever was next to him, the lads tied him to the, uh, tied him to the aircraft chair so he couldn't move, literally, and he was throwing up everywhere. It was like <laughs> green stuff. It was. I thought he was gonna die out there, but uh, another one where he had to be there. But he was a good lad, wasn't he, Joel? Yeah, yeah. Let's see, he was another one that bought into the the sort of night out, and he loved it as much as anyone, but. Another one that you should train so hard that it, like he could have gone out every night of the week, but the way he trained, he was always going to be like superb on a weekend. You, you know yourself, it, it was done at the right time, wasn't it? Yeah. Everything was done at the right time, the laughs and the jokes. We used to go down to the PFA do every year. We used to have a couple of tables down London. We used to go down on the Saturday, have a Saturday night. Sunday. Everything was done at the right time and the majority of the squad was there. But what marks a good change room for me, Mickey, you might agree with this, we could handle different characters in the change rooms. You know, Mickey's always been a family man. He'd make a few trips, he'd make a few nights. You know, Effian Williams, who was a fantastic player, was totally different. Wasn't interested in drink, Mickey, was he? Didn't drink, proper family man. But he was, it made no difference in our change rooms. We, we welcome people like that as well. And that's the, that's the sign of a successful changing room. And that's what you need nowadays as well. You need that, you need that mixture of people. But you also need people to accept people for what they are. But we had, a, we had a good school at Hartlepool, that's for sure. Talking about the PFA, do, Daryl, I remember it was probably the first year we all went as a group in the pub, the Punch and Judy. God, so we, <laughs> brilliant, yeah. It'd be like the Sunday, Sunday sort of dinner time. And every, every footballer that was probably lower leagues and a few from the championship, let over from the premiership, would be in this Punch and Judy. It was a ram with footballers. So everywhere you went, there'd be a friendly face. Hi, hey, all right, how are you doing? This, that, and the other. So Daryl, always being life and soul of the place, whoever walked in, whether he knew them or not, well, here he is, he's robbed the living, top of his voice, come on, give a bit back, get the lads around him, and we're thinking, right soon. But then two minutes later, a tray of drinks would come over for the lads. Next one comes in, they would get someone, I don't know, Kevin Gallon, QPR, come cock me lad, coming in, hey Gallon, you've robbed the living, get the drinks in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to go around with a pint pot. <laughs> Mickey, I used to go around with a pint, but empty pint pot. I said, "Come on, put some money back to the game. You, you've robbed it this season. Get some money." The lads used to love it. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I've done very well in my lifetime not to get chin. To be honest with you, I'm glad everyone's took it the right, the right sort of way. <laughs> Yeah, I do. you know, I look, I look back now and obviously calmed down loads in the last fifteen years, but they were they, they them six years and 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 them nights out. We could be, I could be on here for about four or five hours, keep going on about them. They were 
It was it just fantastic. Like, a lot of them we couldn't say Mickey, could we? To be honest, yeah. Couldn't say not not because doing it. It's just it's just, just it's not for a podcast somehow, you know. <laughs> you know Darryl, move it on slightly over to Danny Wilson a few years later when Danny came, and I, again I remember this like it was yesterday. We we're in we we're in Holland pre-season, and then. Um, <laughs> I've gone down to see the gaffer and the gaffer's like come on Mickey get the lads down for training so I've come back up the rooms I'm knocking on the doors lads come on so one dribs and drabs are coming out you've got five minutes to be downstairs so Daryl comes to the top of the landing you what Mickey? I was like come on the gaffer's waiting for us we're going training top of his voice he's like tell that midget <laughs> tell that midget I'll be at training when I'm ready I'm not listening to what that midget's telling me. I'm coming when I'm ready, not when he's ready. And Daddy at the bottom of the stairs goes, Daryl, I heard all of that. You don't need to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Do you know Danny? Danny's great. I, get, I speak to Danny now. He does a bit of agency work, Danny Wilson. Yeah. I've had a long chat with him before. Uh, do you know what? And, and Danny knew I was joking. But <laughs> oh, I can remember that, to be fair, right, most managers in the day let you have a night out on pre-season trip. You know, go and have a few drinks. But me and Tinks, me and Tinks the night before, we'd, we'd had a few too many bottles of wine. And Danny had to, and I cut my foot. Yeah, I, I remember my that. Foot, I, I, my foot's up on the sink. I've got blood pouring from my foot because I wore flip flops and I had this yeah. quick feet dance, Mickey. Didn't know the yeah, lads yeah, used to yeah, love I it. Remember that. I, I, remember was, being in, I remember being in the toilet with you trying to clean your foot off. Yeah, and, and the gaffer come in, didn't he? Yeah, you were like, Mickey, come on, get it cleaned off. I've got more dancing to do. I want to go back and do it. And I was like, that one here to get you home. <laughs> I know, and I think Danny, Danny, Danny said to Tinks, I think, when Tinks was just as bad as me, Harry got away with it, I don't know, but he said, get, get him out, get him back to the, the, the hotel we're sort of staying at, so, uh, yeah, pre-season, never a good time to have a drink after a six-week pre-season programme. But as well, Darrell, I remember the next day when um, it's, you've got James, a visual, James actually texted me about this the other day, saying it's the worst, it's the worst sort of, thing he's been in when he's trying to give treatment to someone. So Daryl's got glass all in his foot. So James at the side of the training ground, trying to like get it out, his little fly there, tweezers, trying to pull it all out. And Tinks comes over, he starts fighting with Daryl. James is trying to hold, hold Tinks off, trying to pull glass out of his feet. And we're looking over, run around, and you can see Danny just go on. <laughs> He sent me on loan. He sent me on loan to Rochdale not long after. <laughs> I, mean, I, can, I can always remember. To be fair, I'd, I'd struggled with injury, and uh, do you know, Danny, Danny, what you could see, I was, I was, I think I was with Danny for six months before I went on loan to Rochdale. Danny was a good manager, Mickey. Wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I learned a lot from his his organisation and and whatnot. He was a good manager. I never played for him. Which was was fine, but I, I liked the way he worked. Yeah, he was straight down the line as well. Totally honest with you, and uh, he he was different class. Danny was. He was a good manager, and I can always remember. I, I haven't worked with him for too long. I can always remember. No, I haven't worked with him. So tell a lie. I haven't worked with him six weeks. I've done the pre-season plan with him, but I've been injured the the season before. And he he pulled me after a couple of weeks after the pre-season trip, and he says, "Rochdale, I want to take you on a six-month loan. I think it'd be a good idea." And uh, you know, I went up to Rochdale, <laughs> came back. The lads were flying. That's the promotion year, wasn't it? Yeah, promotion year, yeah. Yeah. Darrell, just before we move on, because the last thing we do, we ask 10 or 12 just daft questions to get a few quick answers. I know one thing that uh, a lot of people have asked me that they want to ask you is, have you ever been close to getting a Hartlepool United job? Have you ever put in for it? Or has there ever been a time where you had interviews or anything like that? No, I have never, no, never, never put in with it. I obviously knew Russ Green very well and, and the people up there. Uh, I was obviously at Salisbury and I got heavily linked, I think, uh, at one point. And I think uh, a conversation I had with Russ, I think he, he, he might have been interested and ended up getting a pay rise at Salisbury for that one, actually. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, because I went in quite short odds. Listen, it, I, I loved it. I loved my time at Bartley Pool. And you never rule it out. I've got a fantastic daughter that still lives in the town, Katie. Uh, she lives in the town, uh, you know, I'm up there picking her up and bringing her back down. And uh, it'll always be, for me, for, for a town which I think it's, it's picked up loads as a town. You know, I, I lived at the marina when I lived up there. But I love the, 
I love the spirit amongst the fans. The, the fans were great. The passion, you know, they let you know, trust me, you've got to be mentally strong to play for Hartlepool now. And I think this is maybe one of the reasons they probably struggled a little bit. Mm. You've got to be mentally strong to be able to play there because at Hartlepool, you'll get a loud cheer for a tackle sometimes than you will for a, a you know, decent bit of skill. And they've got to see that, you know, they've got to see that 100% passion because it's a working man's club up that way. The fans pay their hard-earned money. And they want a team they want to get behind and support. So uh, hopefully they'll be uh, they'll be back in the near future. Yeah, it's it, that is our take on the situation, Hartlepool. Now, obviously, it's uh, it's been a pretty tumultuous time the last few years, hasn't it? Have you been sort of watching on an interested spectator while that's all unfolded? Hey, of course, I do. Yeah, of course, massively. I was gutted when they got dropped out of the league because I know how difficult it was to 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 go and be able to to be able to get back. Uh, obviously knowing how difficult the National League is. But when I was at the football club, for me, it was a very, very well-run football club. I'm, I'm sure Mickey will, Mickey will agree with me. Here, you know, I know Ken Ogcroft and I have got a bit of stick at the back end of that. But for me, they were fantastic people and, and you know, fantastic owners. We did everything professionally as we possibly could. Uh, money was always paid at, uh, at the right time, and uh, it was a really good club to be at. And I, I, you know, started to get a little bit saddened with with the way things were actually were actually going over a period of time, and then obviously eventually dropping out of the league. So yeah, always always keep my eye out for them. Like saying, my daughter Katie lives in the town as well. Right. So we'll just finish with these these questions, Daryl. Just quick answer and a why. So the like. Ten, I think I've added a couple of extra ones in just for you, so you can give a lad a bit of stick. So yeah, yeah, I'll give them a bit. Don't worry about that. Right, favorite ground you played at and why? Favorite ground I played at. Can I do a favorite goal? Darlow, Edda, Tinkler, Ball. Oh, that's people. one of the next questions. You can't change the question. Just oh, sorry, you... mate. Favorite ground. <laughs> oh, I scored on so many. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Uh, I'm only kidding. I, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Bristol Rovers because you know, when that place is rocking as a yeah, manager, yeah. you know I played there as well. And it was a tough place yeah. to play, but when that place was rocking, boy, they can them fans create an atmosphere with the Irene song and all that. It's the years yeah. on the back of the next stand up, proper, proper, proper fans, you know. And that that was that was for me, mate. I couldn't I couldn't get around that one. You know what it was with Bristol? I could never ever play there because all I could think of every time I warmed up was you can smell them Cornish pasties in the corner. Oh. All the, all the games, like, it, 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 it smells of like Cornish pasties, and I'm like, it's hey, me up. I can, hey, I can smell them at the side of my head if we're playing bad, Mickey. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, we'll go on to the next question, which you've already touched on there. Favourite goal? Favourite goal? Let's go for my 50th Wrexham for Hartlepool. Away. Little scissor kick, back stick. I was playing torrid. I had an absolute nightmare if I scored a goal. That's a story in my career, that. I was going to say, there's no change yet. No. Right, next question. Your toughest opponent? Can you remember, I can remember playing a game, I think it was on loan at Rochdale at the time. There was two guys. Can you remember him, the Blackburn? Centre yeah. midfield. Turkish international. He was only behind uh, like closed doors. For, uh, I've never seen anybody make me look so stupid as him, by the way. He, he was impossible to get the ball off. He was he was unbelievable. I think he was still about 38, 39 as well. He was different class. He was unbelievable. Yeah, so I'll go with him, mate, to be honest. Yep, smashing. Um, player that you played with has had the worst touch, worst first touch. And this was one of your scenes, wasn't it? Oh, first touch switches play. I'm going to go for a <laughs> lad. He was a great lad, but I'm going to go for Andrew Jordan. Cure. He was a session killer, bless him. But he was a cracking lad. He was a cracking lad, to be fair. He was a good lad, but he could kill a session. Stone dead. All right, next one. Player that stole a living the most. Again, another one you're seeing someone stealing a living. Yeah. Have you ever known a centre forward that ends up at left back and gets a street named after it? Hey, there's a clue. Hey, Richie Humphreys. Nah. <laughs> I can't, I can't say Rich. Richie was a model pro, by the way. Steal the living. Cure. Oof. Who you had on the show so far? Melts. No. Cure. Snorefest. <laughs> Jesus. Did you, when did you wake up from that one, by the way? Bless him, Nels. Hey. <laughs> nah, I love Nels as well. Who else you had on? Uh, Brian Honor and Nobsy so far. All oh, right, okay. I don't really know them too well. Uh, steal, in there. steal the living. 
Oh, we had some good players, didn't we? Didn't we? Oh, Proctor, centre forward with his flash car. I used to do my head in it, that boy. What was his name? Eh? Michael was Proctor. It Michael Proctor. He was a good lad, actually. He wasn't a bad lad, but oh, he thought, he, I thought we were signing somebody from Real Madrid. <laughs> 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 right, next, Bruce, one. <laughs> next one, funniest teammate. Who made you laugh? I'm gonna say I should have that crown, Mickey. I'll be disappointed <laughs> if I don't get that crown on every series. But uh made me laugh. I used to I love Tinks, me. <laughs> tinks, Tinks. Mickey, I bet you put him down as well, Tinks, on it. <laughs> Do you know what? That daft graded buffoon. I was out in Durham once. It were only me, him, and probably Boyd. Boyd, yeah, Adam Boyd. <laughs> me, him, and Boyd out in Durham. Literally, night's finished. We've had a cracking night. I've said goodbye to him. Me and Boyd, you're walking up, get a taxi. All of a I turn round. Tinks have pinched the tomato sauce from the kebab house and just squirted me. Full <laughs> bottle of tomato sauce all over me face. <laughs> dripping down me like that. And ran off laughing. I mean, <laughs> What a belter that boy was. Honestly. Honestly Tyrell, he, unless you know him, it, it, the stories cannot do him justice. <laughs> what about when he was having a... What about... Who was he having a rook with? We got his mate. Who was that? What was that in Durham? Have you ever spoke about that? Oh, oh, go on, then tell that if you want. Go on. We haven't, was, we haven't mentioned that one was, was, was it with Borley? Was it Kevin Borley? I can't remember. Kevin Borley. Yeah. <laughs> Things got filled in by Borley. Listen, he went like that. <laughs> <laughs> He'll have to get on here and defend himself, would he? Yeah, we'll get him on and speak about that one. <laughs> right, next question. Ugliest teammate. Oh, face like a bulldog shooting a wash. Shuggy weren't the best, was he? <laughs> oh, Shuggy. Had a hell of a strike on him, boy. Face only a mother could love that boy, but what a great lad. <laughs> Fair enough. Next one. I think I might know who you're going to say before I ask the question, but you could surprise me. The worst dressed teammate. Worst dressed teammate. Oh, Richie all day. <laughs> Richie all day. He used to bring some bad gear. And his mate, JP, Bassy. Them pair of bloody indie, bloody Oasis wannabes. What were they? They, they used to love that, didn't they? They used to do the gigs together, didn't they, them pair? Yeah, they yeah, they were great. I was speaking to JB not long ago, to be honest with you. He's he's running a successful business now. He's yeah, he's, yeah. Uh, yeah. he's laughing at him and he'd be living in the countryside with a massive probably about hundred acres. Yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah, Richie for me all day, Mickey. Fair enough. I thought that might be your answer. Um next question, we've got two left. The biggest drinker. God, in our school, that's tough. You could throw some beers down you, you. You were, you were Andy. I used to walk early Yeah, you did, but <laughs> you made up for it in the day. Uh, <laughs> you, drank, you drank double amount in the day. Oh, we had a hell of a drink in school, didn't we? Like, when the lads went out, they went out. I used to pride myself on being last man standing, to be honest. But uh, I'd have to say, uh, I'd have to go with Westy. Westy could drink. Yeah. No, 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 Tink's, Tink's got to be Tink. No, Boydy. Boy, God, 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 geez, how can I forget him? Adam Boyd, what a talent, but what a drinker. <laughs> yeah, Boydy, Boydy, or oh, Anzong, I forgot about him. Right, and final question, this is from uh, Anthony Sweeney, he's just messages now. Okay. Oh, piano chief, it's good to see you, lad. <laughs> he wants and, to do And that's not because he's got bad teeth, he's just got lots of them and they're all pearly white, so I'm not criticising him too much. Well, funny enough, he wants to know whether you have little teeth or big gums. Hey, listen, I got a lot of stick for my big gums, by the way, off the board in the change rooms. Now I'd be known as bullying and I can still put a claim in, Mickey, don't you worry about that. So you tell Piano to say, hey, listen, what about the day when he knocks his tooth out? Let's talk about that one, Sweden, <laughs> while you've been listening to this. Sweden comes in one day, brilliant. I mean, it weren't funny at the time, but he comes in change rooms. And we're all sat in there. And we've looked at Sweden, he's gone a bit pale. All of a sudden, lads are gone. Sweden's gone, oh, I don't feel great. He sat down and lads are gone, Sweden, you're all right. And he's collapsed and knocked his front tooth out. Like, literally. But, I mean, at the time, it wasn't funny because we're obviously panicking. <laughs> we're flying on the deck, but he knocked his front tooth out. <laughs> at least he didn't get corned off. Oh, yeah, I know, I know. 
Oh, Sreen, I spoke to him the other day as well. He's still at Hartley Pool, isn't he? Yeah. 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 Yeah, great lad. No, great, 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 great times. Cure. Sure. I'm glad I, to be honest, as much as I enjoyed them, I'm glad I've left them behind now. Last 14 years, I've, done that. I've had to do some of that proper growing up last 14, 15 <laughs> years. I've had to ban, I had to I, tell a lie. I think it was Salisbury. I had a I had a night out in Bournemouth, but we got a police escort. I chucked out one place because we were singing 10 Days of Christmas. You know me, Mickey, and I have to finish my song, but we'd upset <laughs> one or two of the regulars, but I was a manager at the time. So uh, that was my final swan song that getting a police escort out of a pub with me players in uh, Bournemouth and we weren't allowed in any more pubs you just for what? singing a Christmas song. Do you know what, Daryl? Just, I mean, just before we do finish this and, and thanks for coming on, but testament to you and I think I can speak on behalf of our group of lads is that how much success you've had as a manager and how much you've had to change and you have changed. You still can be the person that we knew that, that likes to laugh, but You've matured into a, a, a manager of the football club, and and I have huge admiration for you doing that. It's a it's a really tough job, and if you'd asked us back then, would Daryl become manager? I would have said no chance. So I hold my hands up to you, Daryl, and you know how much I think of you. But to be able to mature and and carve out a career as a, a successful manager in the football league, I think um, it's a massive well done to you. And uh, yeah. I really appreciate that, Mickey. But what I'd say, mate, is is that I'll never change. As in, I like you. You know, like you have to change, Mickey, yeah, yeah. In your, as a manager, and you know, and but that, I still have that person. I like that. I'm never changing that for anybody, and I never will. You know, I me, but when we're working, we're working. I laugh people to football club simo. You know what I was like. I'll never change that. But I, I, for me, as a manager. And I say this to my players, and I, I want to finish on this, is that you enjoy it when you're winning. Yeah? So we enjoyed them times, Mickey, but we enjoyed them more when we're winning. And that's yeah. the message I get to, through to my players. We work hard on the training pitch like we did at Hartley Pool. We, we'll kick each other in training. We'll do whatever it takes we can to want to win. The demands are absolutely sky high, exactly how I used to train. Mickey was a prime example of that, and the lads, West. each other in training but you know what you could we could still have a laugh and a joke and enjoy those things and, and a lot of those things like i said uh, earlier in the in the in the podcast a lot of those things chaps i'm talking to management and, and my players i find that a lot of my players will die for me or, and run through bricks walls for me because i allow them to to enjoy it but no it's about them and about wanting to win well, I appreciate that, Mickey. I don't, I don't think many of us have seen me as being a manager, mate, would they, to be honest, than back in the day? No, not, no, my purple, no. not my purple pimp outfit in Newcastle, by the way, no. <laughs> Brilliant, Daryl. That's absolutely fantastic. Thanks very much for that. No, yeah, listen, thanks, thanks for having me on, guys. Simo, great to see you, mate. Listen, sad times getting rid of you at Hartley Pool, mate. You're the heartbeat of that football club, mate. I want to add that on as well. We play people like Mickey and that. We need to get people back at that club. That's what it's about. And listen, uh, I wish you both all the best and no doubt we'll be in touch, chaps. Brilliant. Thanks, Daryl. Appreciate it. And all the best for when the season restarts. Well, Cheers, thanks guys. Everyone for, everyone for listening and uh, watching this afternoon's uh, podcast. We'll be back with another guest next week. Do join us on Switcher Player. But for now, goodbye. Cheers.